you know when technology does not <coughs> work? You have those moments? I have those moments frequently. So what we do in those moments, we abandon technology partially. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It is a big pleasure to be here with you guys today. Um, as, uh, as we shared here, I uh, almost did not make it, but I am very, very honored to be part of this growing movement of people who are really working on um, becoming better a little bit every day than we were before. So every time I get a chance to go somewhere else and talk to people such as yourselves, uh, it's something that uh, you know feeds my soul because I'm trying to do exactly the same thing in a different part of the world that you are. And when I struggle, which I do, I am reminded of you, and that cheers me up. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, but I want to talk to you about these interesting times that we live in. We live in, we live in interesting times. Why do we say that? Well, clearly you can tell that the world is changing. And the world has changed quite a bit since your grandparents were first born. We have put a man and brought him back from the moon. We have been able to circumnavigate the world in a boat in a matter of days or a balloon. We're now able to hop in a huge tin bird and travel across the world in a matter of hours. Something that our forefathers could only have dreamed. And yet, we complain about Wi-Fi signal or the food. Forgetting about the marvelous piece of technology that allows us to do that. And many others, such as these magical little boxes that we have in our hands that would have perhaps been considered witchcraft 150 years ago. We have more information at our finger fingertips than at any point or anyone in history before. These are certainly different times. They are very different in many different ways. Um, and we are struggling to make sense of all those. So we want to take a couple of minutes today to talk about the role spiritism can play and, and does play in making sense of these difficult and changing times and these different landscapes and how we can become a tool that we can avail ourselves with to navigate not only these difficult times but ourselves in the middle of all this. Does that make sense? We're going to do it quick, we're going to do it simple. Idea here is, the idea here is simple. We are going to zoom out a little bit because sometimes when we're so close to something that we love, we fail to properly appreciate it. Sometimes when we when our nose is so so near that picture, that paint, painting that we like, we can't see the splendor of it. And I and I want to argue and posit to you today that spiritism unveils a different way of thinking that was perhaps predestined, but also ahead of its time. But anyways, before I go further, I do want to say that this new era that we live in it's a fascinating one. I think that we can agree that never in the course of our history as a human species have we had so much information as we have today. As a matter of fact, if you amount, uh, if you amass and put together all the information that we have generated as species for the last 150 years, that's more than everything else that we've done combined in our human history before. The exponential growth of information, knowledge, has been astounding. And that's mainly driven by technology. And the more that we can process information quickly, the more knowledge we gain. And the more knowledge we gain, it seems to f uh, uh, feed back into our ability to create more processes and more things, more technology that helps us communicate even further. To make it more clear, imagine this. We are recording this now that may be watched by people in different corners of our world that we may never have heard of before. If we zoom back 600 years ago, less than that, 520 years ago, to Gutenberg, when the printing press came 
That was such a revolutionary invention. It democratized information. All of a sudden, books became less ridiculously expensive. And now maybe the middle class could afford one. And after that, we had the telegraph and the internet and so forth. And we take these things for granted. But we have been in an upswing of information and knowledge that has um, really changed the way we expect life to be and how we interact with each other. And that has also led to some challenges that we, we're going to talk about. But with this new era has come this new thinking. What do I mean by that? We, we seem to live, if you agree with me, on a facts-based society. We want to know the facts. We want to know what's happening, what's the statistics, when did it happen, did it not happen, who was there, and that can be at our finger uh, tips. Our science, uh, scientific level has progressed so quickly that it is no surprise when things become obsolete right after they have basically seen the light of day. Science keeps going forward, keeps progressing, and we now engage in a collaborative way, talking to people that we have never had before, which is totally revolutionary for those who lived 100 years ago. As a matter of fact, if you think about this, the, the very act of interaction and collaboration is one relatively new, because until the 1900s, with the invention of the car, people did not travel more than an average of 20 miles from the place they were born in. Let that sink in for a second. And today, again, I may venture a guess that almost all of us are 20 miles farther than when we were born. I myself hopped on a plane and 15 hours later, I had a chance to be here with you today. It's, it's incredible, it's really incredible. It has led us to be able to exchange information and deal with different people and different perspectives that we had not been exposed to before, and that causes some friction at times, but it's nevertheless very interesting. We have also come to expect a certain level of openness or open source sometimes where people can have access to information or whatever they want to, whatever they, they can. And we are also gem blah, 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 generally clamoring for some sort of democratic access to things. We want to have our voices heard, we want to have our, our opinions considered, and we want the input of many different people. And we want things to be practical. We are no longer in the age of just theoretical, nice academical things. We want to know what is it in for me now? What is it does for me now? So things have changed. Nothing really is as it was 150 years ago. Your doctor if your doctor were to tell you that he or she has not specialized in anything new for the last 150 years, chances are you may not visit them. Right? If your accountant were to tell you that he still calculates things the way it was done on paper 150 years ago, you might not hire their services. Right? Very few fields in the human plethora of abilities have not face substantial advances, except for a couple, and one of them is the field of religious, of ethical thinking. Somehow, religious and ethical thinking has remained or attempted to remain a closed system, wherein one cannot question the original revelation. One must just accept it. It is because it is. It is because God said so. It is because a cleric said God said so. That has also caused many of us to veer away from traditional organized religion and to look for something else. And that is really interesting because with all this technology and all this knowledge, we wonder where is all those wi the wisdom that this information has brought us? to quote the, poet, the, the American British poet, poet T.S. Eliot. Where is all the wisdom that all this information brought us? Have we been able to make sense of all this in our lives, of all this technology and all this comfort? Have we been able to make our lives better emotionally and morally with all these advancements? Chances are not as much. One indication of such a fact is the rising rates of suicide 
attempts and successes in the, the, in, the, um, in the industrial and modern world. So there is something missing. But could we? Could we then seek what's missing by using the same skills and the same things that our society is craving? Could we develop some sort of facts-based approach that continue to grow and deepen its studies into morality and ethics and spirituality? Could we work collaborative with different people in different places? Could we make it open to anyone? Could we invite whoever wanted to to be part of this movement of discovery of the spirit of the soul in such a way <coughs> that it could be practical for us? Maybe this is the time for us to put forth something new that looks at our moral life in that aspect. But if we know our history, we don't need to. Because the truth is that in 1857, in Paris, France, that's exactly what happened. Out of the observation of a fact-based phenomena that was taking place in Paris, France, we had a chance to understand the interactions of the spiritual world with the physical world through the studies realized by one man with the help of many others in many different parts working together collaboratively to bring the information <coughs> that is open to all and that we call spiritism which is nothing more than a progressive body of knowledge a science that keeps adding information to itself. And that's what's fascinating to me, because when we look back to one of the definitions of spiritism that Kardec has brought us, it is a science, a body of knowledge, which deals with the nature, origin, and destiny of spirits. That is, with who we are, where do we truly come from, and where are we going, and how we relate to this world. It is the answer to these old age questions we have been asking ourselves, but in a way that has been demystified, in a way that has been made more accessible to anybody who is willing to look at. That's what's fascinating because the modern thinking <coughs> that we have developed and expect of our modern age is present in the very origin of spiritism. Follow here with me for a second. Spiritism was born of inquiry. Kardec did not set out to create something. He set out to investigate something. By questioning the physical world around us, he arrived at some conclusions that have been extremely impactful to all of us. But his intention wasn't to create, it was to investigate. It was to innovate, to just figure things out. At the same time, spiritism did not start with Kardec and finish with Kardec, which generally happens with all kinds of religious revelations. It contains itself in a bubble and rejects any new input. But spiritism, by definition, is a science of inquiry, of experimentation. It starts with Kardec, and upon Kardec, we have tons and tons of other authors and collaborators who continue to create content that stands on the foundations but builds onto what was there to launch us into even farther realms. Not so dissimilar from science, if you think about it. That continues to build in itself. And it's also collaborative by nature. We read the name Alon Kardec in those books and we are right to honor the man who edited those books and put the content in order. But it is a disservice for us not to talk about the unsung heroes who contributed to that content. It is not his ideas that are present in his book. It is a collection of hundreds of different intelligences, perhaps thousands of different intelligences, working together in both realms of life to provide us with accurate content that was vetted by a scientific process of, I would check over here, and I would check over there. If they match, then we will include them in the Spirit's book. It's a fascinating collaborative nature that takes place very ahead of its time. And fascinating as well, it's always free and open to all. 
Spiritism, by definition, is open source. It just is. There is no hierarchy. There are no priests. There are no bosses. It makes it very confusing sometimes that we want one. <laughs> right? But there is a beauty in this. It is decentralized on purpose so that it cannot be co-opted. Like many times, some important spiritual messages have been through times. There can be no kidnapping of spiritism, as one can argue has happened with parts of Christianity. Yes, I said it. Sometimes I think people kidnap Jesus. Yes. Right? The Jesus I've read about after reading spiritism is very different than the Jesus that people tell me about. The Jesus I grew up with. The Jesus I grew up with was perhaps a little judgmental, <laughs> according to the priests in my Catholic school. <laughs> However, when I was a little bit older and read and learned by myself, there is no other human being that was so inclusive and so accepting and tolerant of anyone at any point in time. That's a departure from what was there, but I digress. But my point here is this. We have been given this incredible tool that is ahead of its time because it, 150 years ago, before the beginning even of this incredible explosion of knowledge that we see today, came down to give us a tool and a method through which we could objectively make sense of phenomena that were taking place in our physical world, make a connection for the existence of the spirit on the other side, and developed a way in which we can constantly communicate to make sure that we are getting good information, information that is not going stale, that is not being misinterpreted as it's passed from generation to generation. Information that keeps itself fresh and up to date because we are constantly going back to the source when we need to. It's a radically and fundamentally revolutionary approach different than everything else that we have ever seen in the field of religious or ethical thinking. And we forget that. And so that is one of the reasons I find spiritism so powerful. But in its method, there's also one last message it leaves us. Yes, it is born out of inquiry. Yes, it continues to amass information and grow dynamically. Yes, it is collaborative by nature. And it's always free and open to all. But because spiritism never tells us what to do, it's not dogmatic. It only suggests. I wonder if it's not whispering in our ears the same invitation it has made to the world. I wonder if we too should not wonder if we need to be more born out of inquiry if we are curious enough about the world around us, if we are continuing to grow and study in our own development enough, if we are being collaborative enough, if we are sharing that which we have with others, <coughs> and if we are always doing that and being open free to all those around us and to ourselves. So I think the invitation Spiritism leaves us with in these changing times is one that perhaps merits some contemplation. We should continue to do all these things, to fast forward and fail forward if we wish, to advance as fast as we can towards our own happiness by our own efforts, by our own investigation, by our own merits, while at the same time not forgetting that this is a communal sport. It's not just an individual race. It's a team sport. The collaborative piece there is an important one. Because the goal of spiritism in my eyes is not to make more spiritists. It's to help make better humans. And so, as we continue to look through all of this, we see that spiritism is incredibly transformative because it is practical. It does not impose. It mainly gives us the information that we may find useful 
to change ourselves, because in changing ourselves, we change the world around us. When we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. And that is a, a beautiful awareness, but also a deeply moving feeling, because when we begin to realize that Spiritism tells us about reincarnation, divine justice, and all these wonderful things you're hearing about here today, it should bring some joy to our hearts to know that we're never alone. We are never forgotten, not for a single minute. And all the love that we have built over our lifetime doesn't go away. When those that you love pass away, do you stop loving them? Do you think that they stop loving you? No. So the love we have on the other side, with the certainty that's brought to us, is far beyond anything that we can imagine. And in our darkest days, whatever you may be in this world or the next, you can rest assured that beyond the incredible love of God, which is even difficult to conceive, beyond the friendship and incredible support of this incredible being, the Christ, which we have trouble struggling to understand who he is, you have the love of all those you have ever lived with, your partners, your mothers, your fathers, your brothers, your friends, whether you remember them or not. And that certainty is one that we ought to keep in our hearts because we ought, just like Spiritism does, to continue to build on it. And hopefully, more and more, we'll have this new thinking installed in our own hearts so that we can make a new era, not only for ourselves, but for others. Thank you for your patience, and I hope that Spiritism may continue to bring you the joy that it has brought me in my life. Thank you.